um, that's a blessing. So we're going to continue studying in First Thessalonians this week, and we're looking at what it is to be an everyday disciple or follower of Jesus. And I think we can look anywhere in the Bible, especially in the New Testament and in the Old Covenant too, just in preparation of what it looks like to follow Jesus. But anywhere we look, you can find out what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. So uh, it's pretty easy to look at a church that Paul uh, has founded, essentially, uh, through God's Word in a pagan environment. It was one of the largest cities in Greece, 200,000, twice as big as Sandy Springs, over twice as big as Sandy Springs. And within six months, revival had broken out and spread throughout the whole city. This was an international city, a port city. It was an important city in commerce. Uh, There was mostly mostly, um, uh, of Greek origin. There were some Romans, uh, some uh, Jewish um, synagogues there, but mostly Greek. And for the word of God just to spread through there, there had to be something uh, that, that, that created that. And, and I think the reason I started today earlier talking about joy is why would, why would you follow somebody that wasn't uh, full of joy? I mean, there would be no reason for you if someone was going to give you a message and there was no joy there then why in the world would you want to ask any more about it? So obviously I think there was joy that was spreading through this city. And I think joy and love uh, kind of go hand in hand because if you're not enjoying who you're with, then you're not going to be loving who you're with. So you, you, the joy of the Lord and a love relationship with him go hand in hand. So if revival spread to, let's say, half the city, we don't know for sure, but 100,000 people, uh, that's uh, that's a pretty joyous occasion, occasion, and people have to have uh, uh, be telling other people that hey, something has happened in my life uh, that has changed me. Or people would have to be asking their friends and family, "What has happened in your life that has changed you?" So our our desire is in this uh, series, everyday disciple, is to see uh, our city, Sandy Springs, changed. I, I think our lives have to change first, our relationships, uh, family relationships, work relationships, and ultimately our city, our, our nation, our world, we want to see change for Jesus. I think that's, that would be the desire. And it's only going to happen through this eternal joy, not because of the, the happy things that come along with being a Christian, because not everything is happy that uh, um, when we become a Christian. In fact, uh, especially during Paul's life, we can see some really uh, severe trials in his life. Um, we said last week there was either a revival or a riot wherever he went. So people were either trying to stone him to death or people were falling down on their face praising God. Uh, those were the two options when Paul spoke. So um, I don't think it's really that much different for us today. So. Uh, Let's just dig into the scripture a little bit. Everyday disciples, making Jesus a priority. So if we're going to follow Jesus, then we have to, he has to be the center of who, who, what our life is about. We have to have that person of Jesus to follow. And I can sum up these eight um, verses or so that we're going to be studying, 11 verses. Uh, We will work worthy of his word for the joy of Jesus. We will work worthy of his word for the joy of Jesus. That pretty much sums up what we're going to be talking about over the next few minutes. So see if you can find that sentence uh, in the next few verses. Um, If you're going to be a disciple, then you're going to be a follower or a learner. A disciple really just means a learner, someone who is learning from someone else. So we, we don't have as much of a, an apprenticeship system in our society any, anymore, but I kind of grew up as an apprentice. My dad was a builder, and y'all have heard this story before, and uh, I kind of said, well, I want to be a builder too, Dad, you know, not knowing what, what in the world I was going to be getting into for the next 30 years. But um, So he handed me a shovel. He goes, you want to be a builder? Here's a shovel. Go dig a ditch. And so if you think about it, if you want to be something or do something, you really have to know foundationally what you're getting into and learn that. And so how you foundationally learn how to build a house is literally you have to dig the foundation. So I learned how to dig a really good ditch. That's what I did. 
And when I learned how to dig a really good ditch, then he handed me uh, uh, the keys to the bobcat. And then I got to move a little more dirt. And then I got to do a little few more things. So over the years, I was, I was going through this apprenticeship uh, program um, learning how to be a builder. And I think as Christians, if we say, hey, I want to follow Jesus, God's going to give us uh, a shovel <laughs> and tell us uh, to go out and love someone. He's going to give us something to do. There's um, uh, Solidarity Sandy Springs just moved right around the corner from us here. Uh, they're good friends of ours. I, I, I think it's a great thing for us to be able to go do. Those are the first steps a lot of times for new Christians just to go and serve uh, your neighbor, just to just to hand out food to those who are in need. That's a, that's a simple step that we can take as a church. That's putting a shovel in our hands and saying, okay, we're going to go feed our neighbor. And, and trust that God's going to honor that, that, that others are going to see the joy in our service to him. We're doing that not because of obligation or trying to earn something from him or trying to make ourselves feel better about what we're doing. We're doing that to honor him because we have tasted and seen that that love of, of his is better than anything else. And, and the way we experience that is to share that with others. And sometimes that's just handing out food. Uh, Luke, you do a great job of going out into the, the basketball courts in the neighborhoods and um, probably some pretty tough neighborhoods and just you take some food with you, you hand it out, you get to know the guys, you play some basketball with them, and you tell them about Jesus. They're going to want to know what's different about you. And you tell them about Jesus, and they, they respond. Um, I've had the opportunity this past week to uh, get a lot of responses through an outreach program that we're dealing with, where, and it's not only women, but men too, have been calling emailing me about lost love, a, a separation or marriage or, or a death uh, from a spouse. And, and they want to know to, what to do with this grief and this pain and this anger that they're experiencing because of this separation of this, of this relationship. And um, I, I don't have any other answer for them other than to replace uh, that loss with Jesus. Jesus is the only, only way to replace loss and pain uh, in your life and it doesn't mean that the grief process ends when Jesus comes into your life but but you have a source and you have a power and you have a love that's going to fill that emptiness and and so uh, the people that I've talked to in the last week or two have been empty have been searching have been in pain and I've just had a chance to share Jesus with them and we've um, seen one lady uh, respond and, and receive Jesus and pray to receive him as her Lord and Savior. It was a, it was a sweet moment. Um, so uh, I say all that this, to say that disciples work hard. When we say, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus, it's not like we get on a, a ride at Six Flags or you know we're having a good summer break like our kids are having right now, kind of in between high school and college. Our kids are having some fun. That's Yeah, there's going to be some fun to it, but we're going to also have to work at uh, being followers of Jesus. And it's not that we're earning something or becoming a better Christian or anything else. It's just that we're learning our trade and we're learning uh, how to be a follower of Jesus. We're learning to be like Jesus. So uh, let's just read what Paul said. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our labor and hardship. It was by working day and night so that not to burden any of you that we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how devout, uh, devoutly, devoutly and rightly and blamelessly we behaved toward you believers. So Paul was a hard worker. Paul worked hard. He, he was uh, one of the smartest guys um, in, in the... Um, in the sand in the um, Jewish ranks when he came through and that's when Jesus uh, met him on the Damascus Road and Paul continued to use that hard work and that work ethic and and the intelligence that God had given him uh, to share the truth with others and so this is uh, this is basically him reminding them remember I worked hard on your behalf uh, I, I was not a burden to you. I came, I worked, and I shared. And um, I think that's kind of basically him encouraging them to pick up their own shovel. Whatever it is that God has given you in your life, 
um, to work hard at it. it may, you know, I, I think we we do have to start reading our Bibles. And a lot of times we'll go through periods where we go, oh, I don't need to read my Bible. Um, but you know, God's Word has power. God's Word has truth. And, and sometimes reading the Bible is hard. Sometimes there's other things that we would rather be doing or need to be doing. And, you know, stopping long enough to read the Bible for 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes a day is not convenient. It's hard work to read the Bible. Sometimes we have to study it to even understand it. It's it's confusing at times. So there's some hard work in reading the Bible. Uh, prayer is so is really important. I think it's really important to talk to God and talk to Him through your uh, the lens of of Scripture, through the understanding of the Bible. So first you have to understand God's Word. Then as you pray it back to Him and pray with Him, that's hard too. It's hard to pray. Uh, you know, there's some people that may have a gift of prayer and it comes a little easier, but for most of us, praying takes time and it takes practice and it takes an effort and, and it and it takes knowing God's word uh, to be able to commune back and forth with Him, just like the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are in this this communion constantly. Uh, Paul says, "Pray without ceasing." We too are to have this prayer life that is ongoing. Now, that doesn't mean we, you know. Get, have to stay in our prayer closet all day long, uh, but it, but it is a pattern of our lives. It is a practice that we pray on an ongoing basis, and so um, prayer is hard. Um, talking to this lady that had lost, was separated, and had children, and uh, was in tears on the phone. I mean, that was not easy. That was hard. Um, I think ultimately, when we get to a place where God allows us to share with a person in that condition, um, we've done some hard work. We've dug the foundation. We've built the, you know, that part of that house that needs it. And now we're starting to be able to put in some of the, the, the nicer things in the house, the cabinets and the countertops and the appliances, and all the other nice things. We start to know why and how they fit together. When we're talking to somebody that's hurting and lost, we can then start fitting things together and we'll hear their story and be able to fit part of the Bible together and some of the prayer time we've had, maybe God has prepared us to talk to that person. And so it's it's hard work. Um, maybe it's a, a neighbor in need. That's just a, you know, something we can go to a neighbor. And um, we've got some new neighbors moving in our neighborhood with a lot of new kids and uh, just going and hanging out with them. Sometimes going to watch fireworks, that wasn't very hard work. That was kind of fun. So I'm not saying this is all going to be drudgery. I'm just saying we have to be aware of uh, what God has done for us, what he's called us to do, and be willing to be uh, used by him and to share the joy that we have. If we're worried about all the issues in our life, then it's hard to be full of joy for others. So um, the, next, uh, the next point that I think Paul makes is that we're to walk in this journey worthy of who we are god has made us new creations in christ he has made us his children he has he has made us right with him through the shed blood of jesus so we can walk and make choices that look like we are part of god's family or we can make choices that look like we used to look like which are not necessarily probably for most of us the best choices so um, we can walk worthy disciples walk worthy so they work hard they walk worthy and um, let's look at what Paul says just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory so this is pretty powerful, just these two verses. Um, Paul is really encouraging these, these new disciples to walk in a manner that they've been called to walk into. We've, we've, once you've received Jesus, then we're called to walk like Jesus. And God's not going to beat us over the head if we make a mistake, or he's not going to chastise us or, or shame us if we don't do the right thing or say the right thing all day long. But there should be a pattern in our lives that starts to develop over time. And that pattern will start to look more and more like Jesus. Now with this early church, the reason we're studying them, because all this happened in six months. God 
uh, took and used the church and spread it all over the whole known world in just a few short years. And so these people that started hearing the message were being persecuted. They were being, they were being sent all over the world. A lot of times they were running for their lives and God's word was going with them. The message was spreading. So um, as they went, they walked worthy. Uh, we're all adopted as we choose Christ into his kingdom and into his glory. And, and glory, I, I looked, looked up a few different definitions. And obviously glory is, you know, we think about the angels and coming down and singing glory, hallelujah. But it, it's a, a distinction extended by common consent. Uh, is one of the definitions that I looked up, a distinction extended by common consent. So there's, there's a relationship involved in this glory between God and us. We get to share in his glory. He extends his glory to us. We get to share in his glory and then represent his glory to others. That's a pretty amazing thing if you think about it. God, the creator of all things, sharing his glory with us, and then allowing us to then share that glory with others. Um, an extended common consent. I think one, just to kind of carry the house building illustration on a little further, and maybe define glory in a way that um, might be a little easier to understand in that regard, is that last year during COVID, we were able to build two houses uh, which was paid our bills, which my wife was happy about. My kids enjoyed being able to uh, get one of them go to college and the others get ready to go to college. So we still had some income, which was a positive thing. But we were able to do it because I was able to build two houses for two previous homeowners that we had built for. So these people came back to us. One, they'd moved into a brand new house over in Brookhaven. It was a beautiful house. Um, they was kind of that was their retirement dream home and they got in it and they kind of looked around and said this is beautiful and perfect but it's just too small <laughs> so we they came back and said we love our house but it's just too small can we have a, can we build another one so uh we said sure <laughs> we'll build a bigger house for you if you want us to so we design build we start from scratch design the whole house all the way through find the property and and start from scratch all the way and these are really nice homes um uh, uh the second one was in decatur and this gentleman and this husband and wife uh, had had us build a house for him a couple years ago it was in the wrong school zone uh, it turned out and they wanted to be in another school district. So they said, would you build us another house? And we said, sure, we'll drop to Decatur. Uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the easiest um, uh, uh, drive every day down to Decatur, but it was, it, we were building a house for someone we had already built a house for. So here, the two houses we had, the income that we got last year was from two former homeowners who said, we loved our house, we want you to build another house for us. So they basically said, we're consenting with you. We're extending a distinction uh, of the quality of our home to, to you and saying, will you build us another one? There was a common extension uh, of appreciation. In other words, the glory of that process and that relationship extended to another house because they were happy with the way that we performed our duties. So we built a house that they loved, but they needed it. One of them needed it somewhere else, and one of them needed it a little bigger, and they called us back to do it again. That's kind of what I think extending glory uh, by common consent is, just in a practical sense. So God extends us this love and this glory from his son so that we can then walk it out, so that we, could, we can represent him um, to a lost and dying world. Um, Disciples work hard, uh, they walk worthy, and they receive the word of truth. So we talked a little bit about that, how important uh, staying in the word is, the Bible. Uh, Paul says, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of mere men, but as what it really is, 
the word of God, which also is at work in you who believe. So here we hear these words again, these, these words where the word of God is at work and it requires us to accept it. We, we have to receive, accept, and walk out in this word. And we have to work it out in our lives. And God is glorified and we get to participate in his glory. Uh, it's an amazing process that he has um, reinstituted because he, he initially instituted this process in the garden with Adam and Eve. It was a perfect relationship between God and man. And we, um, by nature and by choice, all turned our backs on God. We said, nah, I can do it on my own. So we walked away from that. But, but he has made a way for us to get right again. Um, so in the beginning, in Genesis, God said, when he got done creating the universe and um, us and everything else, he said, it is good. So God created everything, and he said, it is good. We, we said, eh, it's not good enough for us. We can make it a little better. That didn't, that didn't work out so well for any of us. So then God said, and uh, on the cross, it is finished. So he had to go to some extreme measures to bring us back to the place where it is good. And the, the, that's good news. That's, that's the gospel. But the part that we often don't um, consider and, and don't focus on is that one day he's going to say, it is done. He's coming back. Jesus finished the work on the cross and God's going to finish the um, the final work where we then enter into an eternal relationship with, with him and with each other in glorified bodies and in glorified relationships uh, with each other and with him. So uh, he said, it is good, not good enough for us. It is finished. He made us right. And I'm coming back to get you and it will be done. So disciples learn this. They understand where we are in the process, which is helping others come along, being joyful, being full of love, and, and and helping others understand what it looks like to be like Jesus. In other words, we're kind of like my dad was with me. He taught me the building business, and Jesus is now, for you, teaching you what it is to be like him. Each one of you have a relationship with Jesus, and he is teaching you individually specifically uh, in the distinct way that he made you to be like him. In the uniqueness of who you are, no one else is going to look like you, uh, but we're all going to be like Jesus. And he, we will know him and he will know us because we will be like him. That's, an, that's a crazy thing for us to grasp. But he is in the process of making us like him. So disciples imitate Jesus. If that's who we're going to be, then that's what we do. We imitate him. We work hard. We walk worthy. We receive his word, and we imitate him. We're followers. We're learners. We talked about that. Uh, the rabbis of his day had a group of disciples that would follow the rabbi around and learn and live with them. Uh, that's what we're to do. We're to follow Jesus around. Paul says in verse 14, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing God, but hostile to all people. So th this isn't necessarily a sugar-coated message. Joy is not necessarily sugar-coated. Joy is something that has to come from that eternal relationship with God, not based on what's happening to us each day. And sometimes as Christians, and more so, I think, recently and maybe going forward, we're going to uh, experience uh, some pushback from our society. I think we're already starting to see some of that. Um, I don't think we've, we've seen it like some other places in the world. Um, having been in Cuba, uh, I know we haven't seen it anywhere near like that. Um, 
in the Middle East. Um, we haven't seen it like that in China. We haven't seen it like that. But God's church is flourishing in those areas where society is pushing back against Christians. Because God's spirit then is free to move and there's, we're not entangled by this world. So this world has not got a grip on these other countries where they are under uh, authoritative rule, where they're in essentially a police state, where they have no rights of their own. In those environments, the Holy Spirit moves because people need something besides what the state has, which is a, basically abuse and human neglect. Um, that's where people become uh, available to God. So uh, I think we've had it pretty easy in the U.S. Uh, and uh, we may be coming to a place, especially some of you younger guys, where in 10, 20, 30 years, they're, they're, you may be leaning on your faith in a different way than you're leaning on it right now. So, how do disciples spread joy? If, if we know that we may be entering into some difficult times in the future, uh, we still have to spread joy because that's going to be our nature. Our nature is going to be uh, joyous people. We're going to celebrate what God has done in our life. We have gone from death to life. That's, we've got to celebrate that. There's no, other, there's no other real option for us when we realize that we've gone from death to life in Christ Jesus. And Paul tells us, But we, brothers and sisters, having been orphaned from you by absence for a short time, while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to see you, I, Paul, more than once, and Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of pride in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Or is it not indeed you for our glory and joy? So here's that word again. Here's that word glory and joy. So it's a life well lived when we can say we're experiencing this joy and this glory because we're starting to look more like Jesus. A, a life well lived. Uh, a life where we follow Jesus and we've worked hard, we've walked worthy, we've, we've received his word daily, uh, we imitate, we follow Jesus on a, on a moment by moment basis and we naturally spread joy. That's what, that is the, the fruit that comes out of a life that's well lived. So we work worthy of his word and the joy of Jesus. So our prayer is for St. Smith Community Church, uh, albeit um, shaken a bit from COVID, um, we still uh, trust that God is, loves Sandy Springs. Uh, we still trust that he loves the people that don't know him in our community. And if he can take uh, Paul and a handful of Christians and turn a pagan city of 200,000 around, he can turn Sandy Springs around. He can turn North Atlanta around. He can turn the Southeast around. Um, and a lot of people think that he's starting to move. I flew out to California during COVID to watch uh, hundreds of people come to the Lord, get baptized in the Pacific, get baptized up in the high desert in the mountains. Um, there, there's been revivals going uh, all throughout the country in pockets breaking out. So I think God's doing something. And I, I would... I would uh, think that he could do something here in Sandy Springs. So um, why don't we pray towards that? Uh, thank you guys for being patient um, and uh, staying in his word for a little bit and getting a perspective of what it's like to um, be a disciple every day. So let's pray. Thanks, God, that you love us. Thank you that um, you've called us to be everyday disciples, everyday followers, everyday imitators of your son, Jesus. And as a result of that, there's, there's going to be a joy that's everlasting that's going to be attractive uh, by others. And it's going to be eternal joy and a joy that uh, comes um, sometimes by trial and you know, sometimes by fun and happy things. But uh, it's a joy that comes from you and, and it comes from the beginning uh, where you um, knit us in our mother's womb and uh, it comes from the eternal relationship that we'll have when when the uh, new heaven and the new earth drop down and you say it is done from the beginning where you said it is good to the cross where you said it is finished and to the end where you say 
it is done. And uh, I just thank you for uh, allowing us this time to just to worship, to be in your word, to be together as your church, and just to uh, experience the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.